Hey there and good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for spending some of your time with us on this Friday. My name is Rachel Williams and I'm one half of Grind City Coffee. I will be asking these phenomenal coffee friends some questions that I would like to introduce in a moment. Uh, today we have an amazing discussion on Farm to Cup, where we'll be talking about the journey of the coffee bean from the farm to your favorite cup in hand. Uh, we'll be breaking down its origin, the role it plays in our lives, and digging into its future during these changing times. Our goal today is that whatever your role is in this industry, that you'll come away with something, whether it be a fresh perspective, a new idea, or a better understanding. Okay, enough from me. Let's meet our extraordinary panel. We have Lester Lerner, director of Old Willow Coffee Company. He's normally based in Bogota, Colombia, but today he's out actually near the farms. Then we have Cameron Brewer, founder and owner of Athens Coffee Exchange in Athens, Georgia, and John Pittman, co-owner and roaster of Jay Brooks Coffee Roasters in Memphis, Tennessee. Thank you everyone for being here with us today. How's everyone doing? Great. <laughs> We're pretty good, Great. thank you. Awesome, so glad to hear. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump right in and get us started. So the coffee value chain has many components people aren't aware of, such as cultivation, processing, roasting, and consumption. Each phase in the process has environmental, social, economic, and governance issues that affect many people's lives that most don't see along the journey for their favorite beverage. So with each of you having a unique relationship with the many touch points within coffee, will you share more about your role in the farm to cup journey? And what about your role most people don't know or get to see? And Lester, with you being at Old Willow and being at the farm, do you mind kicking us off since you're at the beginning of the journey? No, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel. I'm actually very happy to be here with, with all of you guys. And uh, what can I tell? I mean, here at the farm, we have to deal with many, with many things all together right now, starting from a, a social problem we, 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 we have to deal with every, every harvest pick, is to, to, to hire all the coffee pickers we need to to get for the production unfortunately the social conditions that in well in colombia in general we're facing at the moment makes it a little bit hard as the coffee pickers are not not uh, part of the permanent uh, payroll so it makes it really hard we actually try to pay them a, a little bit more Actually, we pay them 78% over the national average for their production in, in kilograms. Uh, because we actually are trying to produce a specialty coffee, basically, rather than uh, any consumption. So we, we, are, we actually put a lot of emphasis on on, on, on these situations and we, we try actually to, to solve a social problem around the village itself, hiring the most people we can, not only the pickers, but also uh, people that sort all the, all the coffee that they pick because we need the reapers, cherries. We try to teach all of them why it's important to pick the reapers, cherries on, on the trees, from the trees. Uh, so, Basically, we are focused with the people we hire uh, on teaching them. Most of them don't understand because the coffee culture in Colombia is to pick rather volume than quality. So you will see in, in many other farms that they pick like some uh, kind of uh, yellowish cherries rather than the really red ones because they, they are paid by the volume they, they pick every day. So that at the beginning, it was a bit of a struggle while, while they were like getting all the idea of how specialty coffee is being produced and, and so on. But uh, right now we actually are, you know, seeing all the harvest of these thoughts that we try to, to teach uh, all the people that come here. Uh, as we don't actually have, as I mentioned before, a like state-of-the-art machinery, we use a lot of labor to do many of the tasks that we need to to put, you know, uh, on 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 track every every harvest. So uh, 
that is one of the main you know struggles that we have every year additionally uh, in colombia there's no there's no great infrastructure whatsoever so uh, one of the biggest uh, you know barriers we all coffee growers i think we have is uh, actually transportation we are our farm is located in straight line 50 kilometers away from bogota not very far right and uh, like the, the the costs of transporting coffee to bogota it's really expensive and from bogota to any other port i mean you you guys can tell so all those things that that the the social and the government barriers that we have to deal with every every single year makes it a little bit hard for us you know it's not impossible and and actually some sometimes we are on our hands and knees working really hard to produce you know the best coffee hiring the best people and teach all of them additionally here in colombia uh, the coffee industry production industry they all most of them they own really small farms the average is of, of a coffee plantation here in colombia is about 1.4 hectare per mm -hmm. per cultivation uh, fortunately well i think we well we have planted four hectares of, of coffee plants however most of the of the small producers here around the, the farm they actually have around one hectare each so what we try to do with them is to teach them also the, the good practices of producing specialty coffee by picking the ripest cherries by uh, fertilize the, the the soil the environment three, four times a year when they can, wh wh whether it's organic or chemical uh, fertilizers. So they get a good product. And when we try to negotiate with them, we try to pay them actually a, a bonus over the commodity price to make the like a business attractive for them and also not to reduce the coffee plantations in the country. But at the moment, actually, in, from I think from 2014 to 2018, uh, the coffee plantations plunged like seven uh, percent or, or 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 so. So it it is actually a social problem uh, within all the coffee industry here in the country, and we are trying our best. And I think we're seeing the the good results, and we are on the right track uh, on performing uh, in, within this within this industry trying to be independent from the big uh, coffee marketers and and the union that governs all the coffee environment in the country so uh, i think the results i mean are very visible awesome thank you for sharing cameron how how do you see your role in the coffee journey, especially working with Lester? And, and then I know that you from there also work maybe not directly with John, but it's just amazing how all three of you are connected in your roles throughout this journey. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, I mean, my role is, <laughs> I would say minuscule at best, right? Um, we had a vision to kind of, and, and our, our initial vision was to work with folks like Lester, right? Who don't have huge coffee farms, who have a, you know, have maybe found it difficult or just haven't tried to enter the market here in the US because the reality is like across the coffee producing world, um, there are folks like Lester who have great coffees and I've actually got a, you know, a ton of his coffee sitting over here um, that we've, either roasted, cupped, and whatever. I mean, it's, and they're exceptional coffees, um, but it's really difficult to get into the U.S. market, right? Like, it's super, super tough to 
um, you know, for a small shareholder like Lester, um, with, in the grand scheme of things, like, right, they have four, uh, uh, heck, heck tickers. I can't, <laughs> I don't remember how to pronounce it exactly, but, um, you know, like, like basically a few acres of land that they plant coffee on. And is that attractive necessarily to the big coffee importers? Um, no. Um, is it attractive to, you know, a co-op mentality or a co-op organization who's going to pull coffee from various different farms and, and kind of mix that all together and then sell it to a big coffee importer. I mean, of course that would be right. Like it's economically uh, viable for like a co-op to do something like that. Um, but, but what our vision was right. Kind of getting back to the point was to offer a platform um, to folks like Lester uh, and, and for them to, build trust in our in our model um but also build trust in the relationship and trust like in the process of us being strategic about getting their coffee here to the states um us working with uh you know roasters like john um and, and john and i you know we haven't obviously worked together but hopefully we will one day shameless plug right um but uh <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> yeah but but working with roasters who who understand not only like the, um, not only understand like our vision, but understand Lester's vision for what he wants to do. So we're kind of the, we're kind of the mouthpiece in the States for, for Lester, right? Like we want to sell their coffee. We don't want to market it as our coffee. Um, we're not going to rebrand it as our coffee. It's always going to be old Willow's coffee. And, you know, he and Lester and I were having a conversation last week um, and, and, and it's like, I told him is, is like, Hey man, like you're the celebrity, like you and your workers, like your workforce, the people who are picking the cherries, who are, who are, you know, um, like bagging it, doing all the hard labor. Like you guys are the superstars, right? Like we're just the ones who are able to, to kind of help you bring that to roasters here in the U S. Um, that's hard. Um, and it's, it's hard because it's, uh, you know, there are a lot of coffee importers here in the U S um, and there are a lot of coffee importers who are very ethical and have really great visions and, and, you know, but it's, it's, it's about, we're, we're never going to lock Lester into any sort of binding contract. We're never going to overcommit, um, you know, Lester to, and his, his workforce and his farm to something that's just, you know, a bit unachievable, right? Like we want to be strategic in the way that we're marketing his coffee and the way that we're selling his coffee um, and, and making sure that, you know, the amount that we're selling and the volume that we're selling uh, is an achievable thing for both of us. And that's not only the case with Lester, right? But with um, some of the other farms we work with in Western Central and East Africa, one of the farms we're going to work with in uh, in Brazil, um, you know, we want to be strategic about it um, because there are so many challenges. Like, and and this is what I tell everybody, right? Is like the the global coffee supply chain, agricultural global supply chain, is still one of the most, um, I think, mismanaged and and really, uh, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but like just really um, kind of mismanaged things in the entire world. Uh, and so how do we as a small company help affect positive change in that? And it's working with folks like Lester and folks like John who want to, to understand the story, who share the vision and who get like what we're doing. That's wonderful. That's great. No, I, that is wonderful. John, how do you feel you you fit into the role of the coffee journey? Um, just trying to, I feel like y'all have done an amazing job of breaking down a lot of things a lot of consumers don't see and they're wondering about their cup of coffee and sometimes the price and everything that goes into it and they don't realize, you know, the cost of traveling, the cost of having labor, the mismanaged and sometimes broken uh, mm -hmm. industry of agriculture and trade and things like that. Um, there's so many moving components. John, how do you, how have you seen the farm to cup journey and you play into all of this and how you see going from bean to roast to in the, in people's hands? Okay. Great question, Rachel. And thanks again. I'm going to echo what these guys said. Thank you so much for featuring this topic. Um, it's absolutely cool that you're doing this because the more people know, the better off we all are. So 
kudos to you and Daniel for pulling this off. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind in answering your question is going to sound cliche, and I'm going to apologize in advance for it sounding that way, but I'm not going to apologize for saying it. I know that Lester and um, Cameron are both going to agree with me on this. The, my number one thought was that it's all about relationship. Okay. Um, I echo, I, I'll absolutely amen everything that both of these guys said. Um, I have a, a love for Columbia. I've done some reading about the, the infrastructure there. And as Lester was talking about the challenges that he faces, I was just kind of nodding my head all the way through thinking, yeah, man, it's, it's wild to, to be sitting here talking to someone there in real time who's really reaffirming a lot of the information we're getting um, nowadays. And so my point in that is, and then Cameron, you face challenges in, um, in the matters of trust and, and linkage, you know, in terms of actually setting things up and signing on the dotted line and making things official. There's a lot of risk, there's a lot of trust involved. And so for us on, on our end, um, it really is about relationship. Frankly, I don't have either the money or the expertise or the time to go and do a direct trade kind of arrangement with a coffee producer. I aspire to that someday, and I hope that'll happen. I would so love to be able to go down and meet Lester in person. Uh, well, actually, that's not true because then I'd be bypassing Cameron, so let me not say that. But I'd love to be able to go down with Cameron and shake hands with Lester and say, hey, this guy put me in touch with you. We want to be able to negotiate your terms right now, right here. What do you need? But unfortunately, the vast majority, as I understand it, the vast majority of coffee producers in the world don't have that luxury, okay? Well, the, probably the vast majority of roasters, even specialty roasters like we are, also don't have that luxury. You know, I, I don't have the time or the money or the expertise to, to go to origin and do what these guys do. So I have to trust what they tell me. Now, at the end of the day, they send me samples. I roast my samples and I put that, that finished product in my mouth and I assess it. And so I can tell whether somebody is being straight up with me about the quality of that coffee or not. But at the end of the day, um, every season things change, right, Lester? <laughs> every season. Every season. Yeah, it brings a whole new set of challenges. Every season we roasters have to recalibrate. Even if you get coffee on contract or reserve with a large importer, once the season changes, you're back to zero. You're not going to say, yeah, I'll buy another 120 sacks of whatever. Um, no, you're going to get samples and you're going to assess that thing. It's just there's never really a time or a place in the entire uh, coffee process, I think, where you can just sit back and rest on your laurels. It's a very humbling medium to work with. But I really think that, that the foundation of relationship and trust is what makes a happy arrangement from, from the original producers like Lester through the, the very important middlemen like Cameron. In my world, middleman isn't a, isn't a wordy dirt. It's actually a necessary part of the process because I need his expertise. I need his connections and his relationships. I can't, I can't do that myself. And then I take what these guys have so carefully brought to this country and we'll get a shipment in and it's almost like a, you know, the heavens open and you hear this, ha oh, ha, oh, you know, it's like, because <laughs> you're, you're aware at some level of what it took to get these beans to this process. And so I feel like I'm being entrusted with something. I mean, it, it sounds ridiculous and people are going to be rolling their eyes and whatever, but you know how many people's hands have been on this product and all the effort and time and expertise and blood, sweat and tears it took to get it here. And so it's really fulfilling when you extend that trust, you take a risk, you extend that trust to someone like Cameron and Lester, they send you the goods. It's exactly what they promised, if not better. And then it's like, all right, now I get to play with this. Ooh, I've got to take this seriously because it costs a lot, you know, and then I play with it. I find a sweet spot and then people enjoy it. And it's, it's the type of thing where, where when we all win, all boats rise, you know, we really have to hold each other up. We can't just say, well, you know, that's his problem. I'll let him deal with it and I'll do my thing over here. I don't believe that. I think that what we do affects other people all along the chain. 
And so when you have that, that trust in place with a relationship, then you end up with a stellar product. You, you mentioned, Rachel, the final cost. And as far as, as the economics of it, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I get really frustrated by them, but I don't understand them. I do not fully understand them. And I, I would hazard a guess that these guys both probably understand it better than I do. Uh, in fact, Rachel, you and I have talked about that, haven't we? Yeah. Um, but I can say this, um, in the hearing of Lester and Cameron, at least for us, we do the best we can to promote what you're doing. Because when we do all boats rise, obviously as a business, we need to make some sort of, of workable margins or something like that. But I've found that in coffee, I have to be willing sometimes to rethink what my real priorities are and what my values are. If I can cut my margins a little bit and maybe stretch that out across the supply chain and try to help you guys a little bit more. And I'm not saying, oh, I'm this big angel. I'm just saying these are the kind of questions that come up in my mind. And so I have to think not, well, I, th I would suggest that a responsible roaster should be thinking about every single part, every single link in the chain, so that we can all go forward together. If we tend to pull back and get selfish uh, and say, well, I want this and I don't really care how it affects them, then I think what that does is it begins to be like dominoes that just fall and affect everybody. I, I can't prove that with numbers, but that's what I have gleaned over quite a few years uh, in, in the roasting industry. So when it comes to price and economics, I can't figure all that out. I'm not going to blow smoke about it, but I want to urge our listeners to just realize that, that we're kind of, it's, it's almost like being on a trampoline. You know, one person moves, everybody moves. And it's kind of the same with us. What we do as a group in North America really has shockwaves that go around the world. So I'm thankful that events like this are happening um, where we can spread that knowledge and really help people understand what a blessing, what a, what a pleasure and an honor it is to be able to have something that's crafted uh, with, in Lester's hands and with his team and then successfully make it into this country to people like me because of Cameron being in touch with reality and paying attention to a lot of details that the rest of us will never see in our lives and then bring it through the roasting process to the consumers at home and, uh, and really enjoy it. I think they'll really appreciate the depth of that more, regardless of what they're paying. And I'm not cavalier about money and about pricing, especially in this season when a lot of people are out of work. But at the end of the day, we all face realities in every single part that we play in the chain. And so at least if someone is paying something and they're, they're assessing that quality in their cup, they can rest assured that there's an awful, awful lot of love that's gone into that process from the very beginning. That's awesome. Thank you, John. That was fantastic across the board. That actually leads me into our next question that y'all have, you know, pretty much blown out of the water already. But um, how can we as consumers play a positive part or what to look for to help create a more sustainable coffee industry, both at home and abroad? Because there is a massive coffee uh, crisis right now. And how can we do that not being on the, the side that y'all are this is my turn Any, anybody anybody just jump in <laughs> <laughs> okay well in my point of view as a producer i think it would be supporting local local shops they are the ones as john and cameron said they are the the ones that actually are promoting us you know, so, and in being part of that, of that supply chain doesn't make us invisible. If you, if you buy directly from a big company, uh, well, you can do it. I mean, it's, it would be your choice, but you, you, you bear in mind that buying from big coffee suppliers, it means that I don't know actually how much you can help the producers especially after what, what, what I just said, because of the commodity prices itself that big, big corporations, big coffee corporations pay uh, in the whole supply chain because it's, it's, it is not a small supply chain. Of course, there's a lot of co-ops and there's a lot of intermediaries, but in the end of the day, uh, 
the, the small producer won't earn as much as they deserve, I guess. For a good coffee, they, probably they won't even know how good the coffee can be because the information available, the knowledge available is very limited. And most of the small growers, they see this an opportunity just to survive. But if you support local and small businesses and small roasteries, at least they, they, they will get a fair price for what, what the, you know, the consumer will get in, in the, at the end of the day. Amen. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it sounds like there's just so um, people need to be having more of the conversations and the education to know what's really happening behind the scenes. And without having all of you to speak on it, I, and having groups like SCA and putting information out there, people wouldn't know. And that, you know, how can you make any changes if you don't know what's actually happening? So I appreciate that. And I think it's important. Oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead, John. Um, well, I was going to say, I think it's important too, right, for um, for consumers to ask questions. Um, you know, we, we do this across the board, right? Like with, you know, you think about you go to the grocery store, you go to your, your seafood counter, your meat counter or whatever, um, and, and you're going to ask like, you're going to ask to look at that steak and this steak and you're going to, you know, I mean, maybe if you go to the Whole Foods or something like that and you're buying a, you know, like a rather expensive steak or something, like you're going to, like you're going to just be inquisitive, right? Like intuitively inquisitive to, to where that comes from or whatever. Um, and, and so I think it's up to the consumer uh, to ask questions, to be aware of where their coffee is coming from, you know, like to, to understand that be educated, right. And do their due diligence on like what direct trade versus fair trade versus fair trade organic, like what that means in the grand scheme of things. Um, but like Lester said, right supporting folks like John, supporting folks like, um, you know, your, your local roaster down the street and, and Memphis is full of them, um, who, who are going to be intentional about the coffee that they're sourcing, um, who are going to be intentional about, and it goes back to what John said too, about, about margins and stuff like that. Um, but who are going to be willing to pay a little bit more for really good coffee, uh, that comes from a, uh, more often than not, right, that's going to come from like an ethically sourced um, importer or, uh, you know, source from a farm that they are able to meet, you know, like a Lester or something like that. Um, and so it's, it's important for consumers to, um, I think, live outside of the consumer echo chamber, right, if, if you can call it that, um, or consumer vacuum um, and, 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 and really educate themselves ask the questions um, and understand that it's it's okay to pay twenty dollars for a bag of coffee right like it's it's we've we've been instilled with this ideology that coffee is just such a um, you know a disposable uh, thing a disposable commodity when in when in fact like like coffee is inherently relational and coffee is inherently like has just so many different strings attached to it. Um, it's, it's different than, than most other things. Um, and so, you know, being okay with paying a little bit more understanding that like your money is, is, is going to, uh, Lester and is going to, uh, you know, the, the farmer in Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, whatever. Um, and there are, there are different ways, right, that we and like the import community are, are trying to navigate through like some of the different government regulations and some of the different, um, you know, things that are intended to be good for the farmers that end up being a bit bastardized, like, and, and end up being bad for the farmer in the end. Um, and so we're kind of learning how to sieve through those and weave through those a little bit um, to, to bring a better product, to bring a product that like we pay a little bit more for and the consumer is going to pay a little bit more for and the roaster is going to pay a little bit more for, but understanding that, Hey, that's okay. Like that's not a bad thing. Um, so my two cents. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll echo that. It, one thing that the consumer can remember is that in specialty coffee, I'm sure this is true in other domains as well, but in specialty coffee, what's kind of cool is the specialty roasters are like artisans of old. You know, in medieval times, you went to ye old fair and you'd see the blacksmiths working and all this, but 
nowadays, because we have situations like this right here where we're building a relationship and we're in touch, uh, the, the guys on my end have to be artisans, which means you're putting a lot more um, personal craft and expertise into the finished product as opposed to the, the cookie cutter approach of the large commercial world and the big box stores and the mass produced kinds of products. And so that's really what these guys are talking about here in terms of the extra value for what the end consumer is getting. And so one of the best ways a consumer can support that and also reap the benefits by enjoying it themselves is buying artisan products. So that's what it means as a roaster. When we say we're an, we're an artisan or an artisanal roaster, we roast in small batches. It's because we are literally handcrafting each individual batch of coffee. It's not being mass produced. It's being personally and, and craftily produced. Craftily. I don't know if that's the word I should have said or not, but produced in a craftsmanship that you cannot replicate at the five or hundred or a thousand times level that the large commercial producers are doing. So being in touch with local and having conversations, you kind of up the ante in terms of your knowledge, but also the quality. It happens every time. Well, I love that. So speaking on craftsmanlike quality, here's a fun little question I have. What is your personal favorite roast of coffee bean with drying process and brewing method? I know that's like asking who's your favorite child, but for this moment in time, what is everyone leaning towards and what the first thing that just came into your mind? Everybody. Oh, Cameron, Cameron, you're on mute, Cameron. I'm on mute. There you go. <laughs> uh, um, I'm going to say, and I'm, I'm not saying this just because Lester is here, but there is this 72-hour uh, anaerobic coffee that Lester produces, um, and it's a the variety is Castillo, and it was a mind-blowing coffee. So the 72-hour is, is, is referring to like the anaerobic fermentation process, mm -hmm. and um, I mean, it's it was like um, I mean it was like drinking wine like I mean it was just it was a very very good coffee um, and the variety Castillo is is not um, you know the most expensive variety it's not the you know it's widely produced I think in Lester correct me if I'm wrong but in Colombia pretty widely produced but um, I mean it was uh, when we tasted it we cupped it and we tasted it um, I mean it just kind of transported you into like this different uh, coffee realm um, so awesome coffee and and uh yeah again not just saying that lester because you're here really believe that. <laughs> oh, <it's fine. laughs> i'm really happy to hear that yeah. yeah i hope you guys can try that coffee too you know <laughs> oh yeah would love to i think cameron just made a sale for you lester <laughs> right <laughs> shameless that's plug good. again there we go right <laughs> that's great Actually, we, we do a washed Colombian from Huila department. Um, wow. Please forgive me, Lester, but I have some on reserve, so I kind of have to work through that. But <laughs> we've been playing with that Colombian. And I don't know if you guys at Origin uh, drink things, do you, if you like your coffees mainly in the light zone or in the medium zone. And even that may be a little fuzzy, depending on how you understand those terms. But I like light zone, I guess. Okay, yeah. We've been playing with one in the medium zone, um, and it just, it just unfolds layer after layer of some beautiful warm spice and some nice mixed roasted nut, um, a nice rounded body. Um, but that's, I mean, it's, it's really hard to beat a, a nice Colombian. There's a reason that Colombia is kind of the, the poster child for coffee in the world. Forget about Juan oh. Valdez, we have Lester. <laughs> no, Juan yeah. Valdez, there's no Juan Valdez in this conversation whatsoever. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think my favorite coffee would be, I mean, I love the coffee we produce. And for me, it's like, I'm, I'm passionate about it. But aside of this coffee, I tried one from Tolima. And it was just outstanding, starting from the color, the aroma, and the way you can, you can taste it when it's hot, when it's a little bit colder, and when it's cold. It, in, in each stage, when drinking that coffee, it's just like, as Cameron said, like drinking, I mean, 
either a taste of honey or a glass of wine. Uh, that sounds awesome. Sure. Uh, okay. And well. I'm still a, in terms of in terms of brewing, Rachel, I'm still a fan of French press. We drink a lot of French press around here. Do a lot of pour over, of course, as well. But I'm still a fan of the press. I like it. Oh right, I forgot that one. Of course, you know, I like filtered coffee. Like um, with a drip or it's an um, or Chemex would be fine for me. Chemex, me too. Chemex guy, through and through. Although you know French press, I like French press. I haven't had a good French press in a long time. So John, next time I'm in Memphis, I'm gonna I'm taking you up on that. Absolutely, man. All right. All right. Well, last question, guys. Thank y'all for holding on. Okay. With everything with COVID nineteen. What positive impact do you think will come from this for coffee? That's a big okay, question. That's a, that's a good one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's, who's gonna take this one first? I'll, I'll just answer short. Um, for, for roasters, the only business we're getting right now is grocery store and online sales. Uh, our restaurants, unfortunately, uh, offices are, are largely closed. Restaurants are all shut down and churches as well um, in this part of the country, all meeting from home. So the grocery piece and the online sales are what are giving us anything to do right now. So if anything, I think maybe some people, because they were kind of forced to work at home, may be discovering uh, that their coffee that they drink at the office or the alleged coffee that they drink at the office is really not all that worthwhile. So I'm hoping that we'll come out of this with a greater customer base. Just a, a, a hope, and, and a, I'm kind of hopeful about that. I, I don't know if that's going to be a thing or not, but that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, I, you know, I think I have a tendency to be like a, an optimist, um, which, which is good, right? But, um, you know, I, I think that this really has impacts in a lot of different ways. Um, so at a, at a producer level, and, and, and I certainly don't want to speak for you, Lester, but, but I think it makes you, um, I think at that level, right, like makes you appreciate the folks who are coming to, to pick cherries on your farm and, and caring for them well and making sure that they're safe and taken care of. And so what does that have in a holistic effect? Well, I mean, it like you're, you're going to retain your workforce more, right? Like if, if people know that Lester uh, cares about them and cares about their well-being and cares about, you know, their family and, and takes care of them. Um, I said care quite a lot, but um, mm. you know, just, I mean, she really cares well for them. Then, then they're going to want to come back and work with Lester um, and they're going to, they're going to work hard um, and they're going to, be rewarded for their hard work and, and, you know, at a, at an import level, right? Like it really makes you appreciate the, the global supply chain a, a little bit more, um, obviously can be tweaked and, and improved upon for sure. Um, but you know, I, like it's hard right now to get coffee, like, especially on the African continent, it's hard to get coffee moving. Um, oh. and, uh, and it's very much a, people are figuring out ways to uh, improve that. And, and African folks um, on the continent who are producing coffee are incredibly resilient people. Um, I'm just so much so that it's, it's very humbling, right? Like that I mean, is the best way to put it and puts things into perspective. And so, you know, we're working with a producer out of Cameroon right now to get some of their coffee here to the States. And, um, they tried to find space on a vessel, couldn't find space on a vessel. Um, so we worked out an air shipment kind of air freight deal. Um, and, and so much so that this, this one producer was like, Hey, I'm, I just want to get my coffee to the States. So let me, let me pay some of the costs of air freight. Right. So it's like, like coming up with different ways to ensure that, that coffee is flowing um, and that people are getting their coffee to market here in the U S and in Europe and in Asia um, so I think that there's going to be new and improved upon ways. And, and if, if, if there's something that's always born out of a global crisis, it's people, um, I think, inherently want to learn how to make life a little more um, 
you know, I'm like a little easier, right? Because you just went through such a really tough time. Um, and, and at a roaster level and at a consumer level, um, you know, I think the common thread here, right, is like people are going to be more appreciative of good coffee. People are going to be, um, and like John said, right, like the, the hope for a lot of roasters is um, is that like, you know, folks come out of this and are like, man, like we don't have to settle for, for Keurig coffee at work, right? Like we can have really good coffee. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of positive things that are going to come out of this. And, and even at a very like kind of economic level, uh, the market here in the U S and, and across the world globally was really flooded with a lot of coffee, right? Like kind of going into this. And so there, like you mentioned early on, there was a price crisis and we're still in that. And you know, so I, so I think like people are going to start to rethink, um, uh, the pricing model a little bit, um, and what they're paying for coffee and how we're getting coffee here to the States and to Europe and Asia and, um, you know, central South America. Um, so I think that that'll be good in the long run for sure. Good. I think, um, this COVID thing right now for us, from the producer's point of view, I think it's just like a curse in disguise, you know? Uh, at the beginning, I think we were a little bit scared because of how the supply chain will work. But uh, in the end, like people were really, really committed with us. Like not only you, Cameron, but like here in, in, in the village, our workers and the people who want to come here and work with us they found it like an opportunity. So at first, like the most important thing is that we, we can still produce. So, and, and we have all the labor working right now. We are uh, almost reaching our peak of production and people are, as I said, really committed with us and we are committed with them as well, of course. And, um, here in Colombia, like this is an industry that is like between farmers and producers, it's super collaborative, collaborative. And we try to help each other all the time. So regardless what we do, what kind of coffee you, you, you produce, who you sell the coffee to, but we share not only knowledge, but we try to help each other with logistics or something related to the supply chain that I didn't, I, I cannot see that in like any other industry like that. And I think that like sense and that uh, sense of helping, you know, it's going actually abroad. And all of you guys and all the consumers that want to drink a good cup of coffee and are looking for transparency, and uh, want to know actually where the coffee comes from, I, I actually see a good outcome out of this. People will still drink good coffee and I think they won't stop doing it because of this, uh, this, this virus. And as John said, I mean, we have now other and new um, methods to market our products. We have internet, online, so uh what i've seen from colombia and uh, you know uh, through social media i think that uh, most of the consumers are actually taking care of all of us you know like people like cameron like john like ourselves and many others that are part of this supply chain and actually you know uh, give us i think a little bit of or too much hope to work during these conditions. Thank you. Yes. Um, I feel coffee is resilient because of the people that are behind it and it shows in every single one of you. And thank you so much for being here. Um, I just want to say that. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But if you have any questions or comments for these fantastic coffee friends of ours, uh, please leave a comment and tag them. We might be having a follow-up very soon and be on the lookout for some of these friendly faces and more at the next Grind City Coffee Expo. Stay safe and see you soon.